So thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Abby Manley with The Matriots. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick welcome here and go over some Zoom hygiene before I pass it along to Jen and Emily um, to take away the content of our program tonight. So as we as we gather around, if you could just keep yourselves on mute, um, at least until the end when we do questions. If you have questions along the way, feel free to pop those into the chat. That's probably the easiest way for us to get, get to those. Um, and then we'll, we'd will we love for you to be on camera, but if you don't want to, we completely understand. Um, and then also feel free to use any reactions to raise your hand or use the little celebratory ones for any good news you hear. Um, and we're just so, we're just so happy to have you. So thank you so much. And um, you can always, if you have any questions or need anything from me, just let me know in the chat. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, and, and I'm Emily Shriver, everyone. I'm the CEO of the Matriots. It's nice to see you. Those who I do not know, thank you so much for coming this evening. My guess is you came also to hear the wonderful Jen Miller, who is the executive director of the League of Women Voters and has been just incredibly engaged across the state of Ohio. Uh, I, I see her everywhere I go. So if I see you everywhere I go, then I know that you are just out there trying to work towards fixing and helping our democracy. I'm really honored that I get to share the stage with you this evening. Um, I was just uh, just explaining to her, I, I she is trying to take back the American flag, which maybe she'll tell you a little bit about. Um, but I ran into her at a rally in, in Southwestern Ohio and she handed me two American American flags and she's like we're taking back the flag and then she was off to the next thing and now <laughs> I have stolen her two American flags but I keep them very proudly <laughs> in uh Jen it is so good to see you tonight and I am ready for your wisdom on on how we got here why we're here and and then we'll talk about where we're going all right well um it's my honor to be here with you too um, I have been traveling the state and I just love the people of Ohio. So um, I'm I'm glad to be here to talk about this and, and hope that it helps you. I know where a lot of us are tired, but we have to keep pushing through this finish line. So, um, you know, this idea of making ballot initiatives harder um, is something that's been discussed off and on throughout the years. Um, the league has always been incredibly um, opposed to that. Um, you, many of you may have shown up and been part of um, this uh, in the lame duck of last year where they were trying to make it more difficult and we were able to beat that back. And then they said they were going to come um, back and they did, they came back from break. The lawmakers came back from break earlier than they usually do because um, they said they were going to get it done and get it on the primary ballot. And that didn't work. Um, it wasn't until an out of state billionaire named um, Richard Uline. Um, and if you use Uline company, just know that it's the same guy, even though his last name is spelled a little differently than the company for office supplies. But Richard Uline funneled more than a million dollars into the campaign coffers of lawmakers to get this passed. And um, it was passed through somewhat dubious means um, on the last day it possibly could on May 10th, um, calling for an August special and where we'll only have one issue. And that one issue um, that right now folks are voting on is issue one. Um, and that does three things. And I think y'all know what those are, but one, it upends majority rule if it were to pass um, where we would now have to have ballot initiatives, constitutional ballot initiatives passed by 60%. Um, but even before then, in terms of the qualification stage, it would make um, signature gathering, um, qualifying for the ballot, um, nearly impossible for citizen groups. Um, and that's why we are so vocally opposed, um, because we know for fact that um, it's already incredibly difficult to get um, issues on the ballot. Uh, it's a lot of signatures, takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of volunteers, um, and this would make it even harder because it, instead of 44 counties, it would require 88. That basically means that one county um, could express a veto. You know, you, we've all seen decline to sign campaigns. Maybe some of you collected petitions for the choice amendment. We're seeing more nasty behavior by bad actors. Um, we saw this with the HB6 referendum too, where people collecting signatures or people signing initiatives are, are experiencing bullying from others. 
So if someone didn't want something to get on the ballot, they could focus literally on one county and, 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 and intimidating or discouraging petition signing in one county. And the other 87 counties could get all the signatures they need and that would stop it in its tracks. To make it worse, it would also require, it would also get rid of the grace period or what we call the cure period when a campaign uh, comes up short for signatures. And I can tell you that our campaigns in the past for redistricting reform have come up short. We have sometimes needed that cure period. And that's because again, if you are mostly volunteer run and you're doing a lot of your signatures as volunteers, it takes a long time. It can take months and months and months to get all the signatures you need. And in the meantime, folks can pass away, people can move, and then they're gonna update the registration, which is exactly what we want. Um, but then that means that that signature through no fault of the campaign, is now uh, null and void. It's inaccurate now. And so it's very easy to come up short in the signature campaign. So ultimately, what I'm saying to you is this. This is a special election for special interests. So um, we all came out in droves in opposition over and over and over again. In fact, even in the legislative process, a lot of us asked to testify and weren't even allowed to. Um, and an out-of-state billionaire asks for this election, but, you know, really funds this campaign effort to get this on the ballot, knowing now that it will mean the opposite of what they say. The proponents say that this is to get special interests out of our constitution. It actually does the exact opposite. It means that only well-funded groups will have the option to get out their clipboards and, and, and get something on the ballot. It, it will take it away from groups like ours. It'll make it nearly impossible to get on the ballot, let alone pass. And this, to me, raises a few questions. You know, I I think a lot about women across Ohio. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at women elected officials. Here in the state of Ohio, women make up 50%, 51% of the population, more than 50% of the voting population as well. And women turn out to vote more often than men, right? So we know that women and women voters are critical across the state of Ohio. And I have been really concerned about this being a special election, even for those folks, you know, if somebody were to say it should be hard to change the constitution. And we can we can debate whether that's that is accurate or whether this actual this particular amendment makes it the right kind of hard to change the constitution. Uh, but how is I think that this is disenfranchising women specifically yeah. because a women make up a broader group of the population. So if we remove citizen initiatives, we're removing the women's voice from the table. We already know, right, that that um, we have a gerrymandered legislature and gerrymandered for those of you who are not a, uh, not political science buffs or you don't exactly, you're not indoctrinated into exactly how it works, essentially gerrymandering. And Jen is like an expert on this as well. But it is essentially where our politicians get to choose the people who vote for them as opposed to us choosing who uh, who our politicians are. Um, and so we already have a space where our state of Ohio is gerrymandered. We have a super majority in the Ohio legislature. The Ohio legislature has decided it doesn't really need to listen to our Supreme Court. Um, our Supreme Court has told the legislature that that the gerrymandered districts in the state of Ohio are incorrect. Um, the supermajority also has veto, it has the ability to overcome a veto by the governor, so overcome the executive branch's challenge to its concerns. So the citizen-led initiative is really the key thing that we have left in our state uh, that allows for us to have some kind of control over the governmental process. And if, if a majority of the people who would have been part of the citizen-led initiative are women, women's voices are being left behind if we get rid of the citizen-led initiative. We also know because of the timing here, uh, the timing of a special election, which just last year, House Bill 458 came forward. It told us no more special elections. August special elections are expensive. They are um, they are really difficult to garner support from voters. Uh, you get very low turnout typically in, in August elections, and it's hard to educate people about an August election. We know that, um, and 
that women are oftentimes the primary caregivers in the home for the aged, for the young, for the infirm, right? We know that they are more likely than not doing the most unpaid labor at their offices as well. So their time stretched thin. And women in the state of Ohio hold most of the minimum wage jobs. So they may be doing extra jobs on top of the jobs that they were previously, that they, that they are typically doing. So their, their time is very, very thin. And so getting engaged on a special election to understand a special election and then to get them out to vote for a special election is incredibly challenging. So I see women kind of getting scrunched in this whole process, whether it's by taking away the rights of citizens to speak their mind or alternatively to get them to turn out to vote. Um, I'm excited to report that as of this past weekend, I'm looking at my notes here, over 355,000 people have turned out to vote, which is awesome, right? We still have another week of early voting. We have the actual day of voting, um, which is a significant uh, increase over past special elections. But Jen, what are some of your thoughts about this particular special election being the way in which we're, we're having this massive constitutional conversation? Right. Well, I mean, I have a lot of different thoughts, but one thing I wanted to just say is that I put a link in the chat, which is when this came up in um, the lame duck, the sponsor said there were two reasons for this to be put to make it harder to amend the Constitution. And those two reasons were abortion and gerrymandering. And so the fact that you're bringing up this this gerrymandered legislature that is rigged that um, we are not a red state or a blue state, we're a rigged state. So we have this gerrymandered legislature that then tries to grab even more power for itself, really preventing citizens from um, addressing issues that affect us. Um, and so I wanted to put that in there. But about the August special, I mean, there's so many fascinating things about this. You should know that um, voters are not happy that this has been put on. Uh, they're not happy in general, but they especially are not happy that this has been put on a, um, a special election, an August election. But uh, still, I promise you, I promise you that you have people in your phones, like in your contact list that don't even know that there's an election. And if they do, they don't realize how serious it is, or they don't understand you know, which way they should vote because they're hearing this confusing, scary rhetoric, um, you know, from the yes side. And so Elizabeth is going to share um, some information about our text banking programs that we have. And this is so that you will, you have a script, everything. We're just looking for volunteers that'll help us reach out to everyday Ohioans. It's great because you, you will jump on a Zoom with us. Um, you will just have it from your phone, like the comfort of your house, you know, um, so you can do, uh, it, it'll make it easy for you to be part of that process. But I do think that ultimately they're trying to sneak this by us. Yes, it has everything to do with abortion and also so much more than just abortion, right? Um, they, uh, had to do this. This is the last possible time they could put this on the ballot before the choice amendment would um, be there for voters to, to vote on. And note that um, the Ohio League is, is, is not taking a stance on that just so that we can continue to advocate for voters. And we think it's easier for us to do that in complicated spaces. Um, but bottom line is this is the this, if this passes, it would it would mean that that choice amendment would have to pass by sixty percent. So keep that in mind. And and I want to throw out some policies that have not passed by sixty percent that you and I probably would mm -hmm. think are great. Okay, taking right. the word white male out of voter eligibility in nineteen twenty three in our constitution did not pass by sixty percent. The amendments to integrate the Ohio National Guard with people of color and women in the mid 20th century, neither of those passed by 60%. And today the Ohio National Guard is about 17,000 individuals, about 40% are folks of color and a good quarter to a third are women. Um, minimum wage in 2006 would not have passed. Uh, a whole bunch of the infrastructure bonds that create jobs and, and improve our communities and make our communities healthier and safer 
would not have passed. Um, the amendment in 2015 to protect the Constitution from monopolies would not have passed. So one of the things the proponents love to talk about is how the casino should not be in the Constitution. And the thing is, is Ohio voters agreed and we fixed it in 2015. And now um, monopolies or small groups of businesses cannot use the constitutional process for their own special financial benefit. And uh, that, by the way, passed by just over 51%. And so I bring this to you to say that a lot of things at the time do not pass at that 60% threshold that now we all would agree with. And so it's very important that we keep that majority rule. I also wanna tell you that there's only one state that requires 60% passage on all constitutional amendments and that's Florida. And I don't wanna be Florida. I'm an Ohio girl. I want to be the best Ohio we can be. And this is a check on power for us. This is a way and abortion is a very good example of that, where, you know, this choice amendment really is the freedom to health care, right? And that has been closed through the heartbeat ban. And if, if at some point the Ohio Supreme Court stay falls, then we're, we're really have cons legitimate concerns about our health care. So the people of Ohio are using that citizens initiative to defend that right. We, the people of Ohio, may do the same thing, and we're looking at doing the same thing to end gerrymandering. We could decide in the future to deal with money in politics or to deal with you know, access to the ballot. There's all kinds of things that we could use when the legislature is acting in ways that do not benefit us, our families, our communities. Which I think is one of the reasons why this is of the things we've seen in the state of Ohio in multiple years. This is one of those bipartisan or nonpartisan issues. We see people on both sides of the aisle arguing against issue one, right? Yeah. And coming out and saying, vote now because this is bad government. Tell me a little bit about that because I have and a actually, lot to say there, but I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I've been using a new term and there's two of them and I don't know which one I like better. So y'all can tell me which you like better, but I, I we've been saying tripartisan and we've been saying pan-partisan. Um, okay. And the reason is because this is, you're right, there's uh, Republican and Democrat governors, uh, former governors who are against this, um, former attorneys general who are against this. Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor is against that. this. There you have Republican and Democrat lawmakers. You have nonpartisan groups like the League. You have uh, third party groups like the Libertarians, um, independent voters, a wide range. So we have over 200 organizations that represent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Ohio voters who've all come out against. Think about the FOP or some of the construction trades, or which are a little bit more conservative unions, um, as well as SEIU and, and AFL-CIO, so a wide swath, even within the labor movement. And that's because, again, it's not about one issue. It's about all of us, right? This is truly about our ability to make policies that affect our lives. And it's short-sighted to think about just one issue here. Because right now, and, and I think a lot of conservatives are saying this, right? Like, I didn't always like, you know, Kasich said something to the extent of, and I'm going to totally, but but I thought it was a great comment, but I, I don't have it in front of me. I should have. But he basically said, I didn't always like it when, when uh, voters, you know, took a stance on a ballot issue different than what I believed, but I didn't then go try to rig the game. I didn't go try to change the system. And I think that's the way that we need to make sure we help folks understand it. Statewide bond issue is particularly important too. This is a place where we've gotten a lot of folks, um, especially more conservative folks who are worried about the economy. And that's because we have a debt limit in the Ohio constitution of $750,000. That doesn't probably build a bridge anymore, right? And we have crumbling infrastructure all over the state 
And these statewide bonds is a way of continuing to not just create jobs, but make sure that, you know, Main Street and all of our small towns can function because of the bridges and roads and sewer lines are upgraded, um, as well as things like the Third Frontier or Clean Ohio Fund, which were which are investments in kind of more green um, infrastructure um, or technology. And so statewide bonds alone, if you're if you're talking to folks and you can't get them um, on, on some of these bigger talking points, maybe just talk to them about bonds because what would we do? What would we do if, if we did not have the ability to, or it'd be much harder to pass those statewide bonds that are investing in our communities, making them safer and healthier and a better place to call home. And I do, and I wanna to mention to everybody here, if you have questions yourselves, you can um, stick those in the chat. We're, we're watching the chat over here um, and monitoring that. And we're happy to answer whatever questions you might have, even if they seem out of left field, or even if you think, you know what, this is a really simple question, or you're if you're concerned about asking it, you can direct message Abby and she'll ask it on your behalf. If you don't wanna be the person who, who shows up and doesn't know something though, aren't we always each that person, right? Uh, and so I I also agree, Jen, it, it is fascinating to me that that we're seeing the, I'm like pan-partisan, the pan-partisan support, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna lean in that, on that one. Um, okay. The pan-partisan support for, for um, against, let's go against issue one. Uh, and I think part of that is because there are so many people who believe, um, especially ten, that tend to believe on the right side of the aisle in a limited government. And a limited government would not allow for this type of activity to take place. So um, I, I have been personally very fascinated by the amount of not just panpartisan support, but loud support from both sides of the aisle and additional groups uh, throughout the state. And I guess that leads us to the question of, well, how difficult should it be to change a constitution, right? Um, we've heard the argument um, that, you know, this the, the federal constitution is hard to change. The federal constitution is, um, is a really difficult, and, and we know through the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, that it's an incredibly hard thing to change the United States constitution. And, yeah. and why should a state constitution not be that way? Uh, and, and this harkens back to some of um, my training before I put on my hat as a the leader of the Matriots, maybe it's a tiara, I don't know. Before I put on my hat as the leader of the Matriots, um, you know, I thought a lot about constitutional law. And we asked that question about how hard should a constitution be to change? It should be difficult. But federal constitutions are very different than state constitutions. And if we think of the layering of how our country was created and what's amazing about how it operates, um, that is why we have a federal constitution that does what it does, the limited powers that are not reserved, that are not part of the state constitutions. Tell us a little bit about that, Jen. Help walk us through and explain that perspective for us, if you don't mind. I'm also happy to do a little bit of it as well. Yeah, well, jump in if you want. But yeah, look, first and foremost, the Ohio Constitution is the people's document. It is different in that the federal constitution really limited its powers, right? It really defined what it's what the federal government's powers would be, and then ceded a lot of that authority of governing to the states. And this is why they're different. So it should be that you know, in fact, on average, the state a state constitution is four times the length of the US Constitution. And that's if you look at all of the state constitutions across the country, they're on average four times the length. That's because this is where the governing, a lot of the business of government is determined, is in those state constitutions. Um, here's the thing about Ohio, is that it's already really hard. And we talked about this a little bit, but Ohioans are really discerning um, since 1912, Ohioans have only passed 27% of constitutional ballot initiatives, 27%. So just over one in four. We generally are very careful about what we decide to put in the constitution. Um, and I don't have the stats in front of me, maybe Elizabeth does, but I don't have the stats in front of me in terms of um, how many signature campaigns uh, fail, but the reality is that 
it's also incredibly difficult to get enough signature. So this isn't broke. The system isn't broke. It's already really, really hard to amend the Ohio Constitution, but rightfully so, it's not as hard as the US Constitution because this is our document. And I see Emily Toby has a question in the chat. And if you don't know the answer to this, Jen, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but it was how many other states require a higher threshold than 50%. Do you happen to know from the, I think there's like the, the National Conference of State Governing Boards or yep. similar to that? I don't have it on me. I will say there's one, um, Ill, only Florida is 60%. Illinois has some unusual, there's kind of two thresholds and 60% is part of that. Um, but it's not actually that many states. 18 okay. states allow citizen constitutional amendments. Um, and so, um, and again, we can just be the best Ohio. Let's just be the best Ohio, right? Like, I, I mean, when, 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 uh, but I can tell you that the yes side isn't all like is often kind of conflating these things. I remember when I looked at it, I think I only saw four that were super majorities, but I don't have it in front of me right now. Ballotpedia actually is probably the easiest place to look at it. Okay. Yeah, I, I assumed it was inflated to an extent and I, I've been trying to find the exact literature, but that was one of the only things I saw that sort of caught my eye around, you know, what could be a valid argument from the yes side of the house. So, okay. Thanks, Jen. I mean, the good news, and Emily is one of our one of our Butler County superstars. So um, the good news, Emily, is that we can just point out that only one, only one <laughs> state has the exact 60% threshold, and it's Florida, right? And so why do that? Fair enough. Um, only other question, I guess, while I have you too, is I feel like, and I'm, I'm seeing this in my local area, and I just happen to be north of here over the weekend um, to probably the reddest part of our state where I saw all the yes signs. Um, but a lot of it, I feel like, is becoming very single issue around abortion rates, yay or nay, right? Um, and then also just religious aspects. Um, so I'm seeing, you know, signage at churches and things of that nature. So anything that you can speak to around how to um, pull it away from being a, a single yep. a single issue would be appreciated. Yeah. So, and I, I'll, most of my media tour has purposefully been basically the league loaned me to the campaign all summer. Um, and so most of that media tour has been in the hinterlands and I am from rural Ohio too. And um, uh, I will just mention that I am on a podcast with Faith Choice Ohio this week that comes out too. So Reverend Terry Williams and I will be talking about why we need to oppose issue one together. But I think this is exactly why we have to zoom out and talk about all the kinds of issues that this affects. I actually think this is one of the ways that statewide bond issues is most effective um, because, you know, for example, 1,200 school buildings were built through statewide bonds, right? One in every of our 88 counties. And I think if we point to our history of all the ways that our lives have been made better for and by the people through ballot initiatives. This, I think, really um, pushes back in a more effective way. Pensions for war vets, establishment of local control, you know, integration of the Ohio National Guard. These are all important facts. Um, and when I have been in rooms like in, in Worcester, Ohio, where we had several hundred people um, organized by a league, and we had some pushback. But when you talk about all the things that this impacts, that seems to work. The other thing that seems to work is if you mention, well, what happens if the state legislature becomes really progressive? Mm -hmm. And then they start pushing all of these policies that you don't like and you've just made ballot issues much harder that you know the government can change hands the state house could change hands at some point this is you're upending something that's lasted over a century um and that's why we tend to avoid 
talking about abortion too much, but instead talking about all the collective good that has happened through ballot initiatives, because we think that can kind of work for everyone. And then we also very much talk about this diverse and broad coalition. I think that helps too. You know, um, if Bob Taft is so firmly against and Betty Montgomery and folks like that, then there must be something more to this. Well, and Emily, one of the, you know, it's soundbite politics oftentimes across the state of Ohio. And so one of my favorite um, sound bites is to say like, if, don't burn down the house because you dislike the wallpaper, right? Like one single amendment is not the reason to get rid of a century long worth of precedent of working towards making Ohio better. Uh, and when we notice that our legislature isn't working for us, that we go through the very lengthy and very difficult process of changing the constitution. Um, there is one other way in which citizens can change the laws here in the state of Ohio, citizen-led legislative initiatives. Um, and citizen-led legislative initiatives would change the law of the state of Ohio as opposed to the constitution. So one of the other arguments that kind of I sometimes hear is, well, these are all laws. They're not they don't belong in a constitution, they're supposed to be laws. So there is a citizen-led legislative method for changing the constitution. We're seeing that at play right now with the marijuana um, legislation. There, there is a citizen-led effort to change the Ohio revised code, not the constitution, but the laws of the state of Ohio to allow for recreational marijuana. One of the biggest challenges or biggest problems with that legislative initiative methodology is that um, as soon as something passes and is put into the Ohio Revised Code, there is no waiting period as there are in other states. And so the legislature can just change it right back again. It's a very expensive, very lengthy, very time consuming, exhaustive effort as we see happening with, um, with the marijuana legislation. Very tiring, um, still has that same cure period and that's actually where marijuana is right now. Um, but after all is said and done, it could be changed back by a legislature that doesn't really like that particular piece of legislation. Um, so the way to protect a fundamental right, whether the fundamental right is the right to reproductive health care that at the bottom also includes abortion, or alternatively to some other right that we don't see clearly and expressly defined that needs to be clarified is to put it in a constitution. It's very different than making a law to me. Um, so one of the other questions that we um, that we had and is I you know a lot of times we who are engaged in the in the in the love of politics in the state of Ohio who are often in deep in the conversation we sometimes forget to explain what we mean uh, and so a, a lot of folks have actually asked me what is one person one vote so what is maybe what is the coalition but also what does it mean. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they say, I see one person, one vote all the time. Of course, everyone gets a vote. One person gets a vote. Um, don't vote early, vote often. Um, but but what, it, what does it mean and what's it trying to express in this particular coalition? And I know, Jen, you're one of the strongest members of this coalition. <laughs> so I, I'm interested in your perspective and how that's translating into the work that we're doing um, for, um, for this initiative. I rarely say one person, one vote, because I think it's confusing. Um, it is a standard that is established by the Supreme Court of the United States. And the way I like to think about it is that every person should have an equal vote. And, and that if 40% can block what the majority wants, that means that 40% votes are weighted heavier, right? They're able, the minority can put the thumb on the scale. Um, but I think it's a little bit of a, a nerdy, I mean, it's something we definitely used and I used a lot in the legislature. Um, and we certainly do have a lot of folks talking about it. It is a sacred principle. It is a um, national standard. It is this concept that each one of us has a vote that should be equal in value to everyone else. But um, Emily, I would love for you to kind of explain what how you explain it, because I bet you you do it better than I do. 
I find that very, very hard to believe. Um, but I would, I would say that um, if we look historically, I'm not going to put on like my really deep glasses and get really nerdy about it. But if we were to look historically at the foundation of our country, there were individuals who had come over from previous countries, so previously come over from the United, from Britain, where it wasn't a single person had a single vote, right? Where other in other countries, there some people have more weight to their vote than someone else. And the idea was originally started so that an individual, each individual, um, and we can get deep into the like, whether it was actually each individual, it took us some time to really get to which individuals were individuals, um, but that each individual would count for a single vote, not count for more than that. Um, and so there, what is being translated today for the one person, one vote mentality is that there should not be um, a time when majority rule doesn't apply. And majority rule means 50% plus a single person um, is the deciding method, method for a constitutional change in the state of Ohio. It shouldn't take 60% to pass it. That means all you need is 40% poo-pooing it in order for the um, for something the constitution to not change, so um, so I think it's it is a really hard I think it's a really lofty concept to choose as like the rallying cry of something so simple as our constitution is hard to change anyway, and your your voice matters and should count just as much as your neighbors in making a change to the constitution. Um, so. And thank you for putting here in the chat, the easiest way to compare state's ballot initiative laws are at ballotpedia.org, um, which honestly, y'all, if, if you're not on that site frequently, it is an incredibly helpful site to learn about the candidates who are trying to get into office, about who's passing what, and about generally information about the state of Ohio and our politics. Um, I am interested, Jen, because um, I like to ask questions, in uh, in this question. So there have been individuals, so lawmakers essentially, who said that August elections are a waste of time. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm interested, we talked a little bit about the numbers, we're seeing higher turnout. And I think you answered that we're seeing higher turnout because our folks across the state of Ohio are upset about this. But do you have any other rationales for why we're seeing such high early voter turnout for this particular election? Well, I mean, so look, we don't know what turnout's going to be. If someone asked you this question, this is, I think this is one of the best ways to make the point without really making the point. Um, never in our history in the state of Ohio has the state legislature put an issue of such great importance on an August special election, never. And this is a way of like, so a lot of times I get asked all the time, like, what do you expect turnout to be? What, you know, it could be Emily that a lot of people are just getting it out of the way that they're going on vacation or something. We don't know that we have no idea what voting behavior might be. We have no way of understanding what ultimate turnout is. Am I encouraged that we've seen so many people uh, request their absentee ballot or get to the early vote center? Absolutely. In fact, once we're done here, I'm going to the early vote center to cast my vote um, because it's now open till 730, um, at 8.30 tonight and then 7.30 the rest of the week. Is that right, Elizabeth? Um, they had to make it extra confusing where each day this week is potentially a different set of hours. But um, but what I'm saying to you, Emily, is I don't know why turnout is high. I can tell you that enthusiasm is great. The anger is significant. I like to talk about the fact that I think Ohioans, I think all of us have a little bit of a libertarian streak in us, where it's kind of like we don't necessarily trust government and, and we want government out of our business Right. Mm -hmm. And that this hits right home for us that, oh, you're wait a minute, you're making it harder for us to do a thing, you know, and I think that a lot of people sense that one of the ways that I like to talk about that and I think hits this and could mean why we have a lot of turnout, even though a lot of voters don't know about it, is that if this passes, it means more power for the powerful. 
It means more power for the legislature. It is less power for you. It's less power for me. It's less power for our families, our communities, for teachers, firefighters, nurses, faith leaders. It's less power for all of us. And that, I think, um, I think that that is why we're seeing so much enthusiasm, but we cannot rest. Yes, the polls say that people are strongly leaning no. The indication is that lots of people are turning out, but please don't stop contacting voters in your life about this until the polls close on election day. Well, and you all will probably see that. So the Matriot staff voted last week. Um, I hope that you all head out to vote. If you see me out on the roads, I've changed my license plate in honor of this. So my license plate is we vote. So like, hopefully I'll drive past you. I'm trying to catch everybody to make sure that people get out to vote. Um, but one of the things, one of the other things that we're seeing, and I, I just, well, before I say that, I just want to tell you, I love this statement that it means more power for the powerful. I have written this down and I am going to, it's my next license plate. Um, <laughs> but I, but I wanted to identify a few of the other confusing things for folks so that as you're calling you know, and just real quick, now. we're having a, it's kind of funny, the, the Elizabeth's, uh, it's actually till 830 tonight only, and then 730 the next night. They have, we have one hour of 830 this week, which is ridiculous, but um, the Monday. Secretary site says 730. I just pulled this from the secretary site. That's weird. Okay. It is it that way. Yeah. It's because, and I'll explain why this is just real quick. I'm sorry, no, Emily, is, is that like. They re they when they got rid of the Monday early vote, they had to reallocate those hours and they couldn't be evenly. It was six hours that had to get reallocated to five week, weekdays. And so that's why this today is still 830 and the rest are. Um, but, yeah, I, I will share the exact spot that it comes from. Well, and so as as Jen is sharing that this I mean, this is evidence if we have any evidence at all that we have <laughs> that we have a confusing standard right now for when we vote, where we vote, how we vote, um, we have noticed a number of things that are inconsistent and challenging. So we've got this, the fact first, highest level, August special election. Um, the August special elections title on the ballot itself is, is it enhancing or uplift? What's the title of the actual? Elevating. Elevating. elevating elevating the standards, uh, elevating the standards for uh, not amending, not mm -hmm. changing, not even so, increasing. Elevating is like, woo, elevating. Elevating sounds good. The standards for citizen led ballot initiatives. So that is if you, you know, when you go into the, into the um, voting booth and you have the language pulled up in front of you, you will see um, the words elevating the standards, um, which is in and of itself confusing because to some of us, we would say it's not elevating. It's actually removing um, the ability to have citizen-led ballot initiatives. We can see that the hours have changed. This is These are different hours than we typically see, early vote hours, than we typically see for, um, for our elections leading up to an election. They have eliminated the Monday before uh, the, the, the voting day, the actual in-person voting day, your election day is Tuesday. They have eliminated the Monday hours uh, from that, from our potential to early vote. We know that there have been changes to the voter voter registration laws. Um, you need to have an ID with you when you go to vote. Uh, and so that is confusing to a lot of folks that you need to have a valid state issued or passport ID or military ID with you to be able to vote. We also know that they've changed some of the precincts and the locations where people vote. Uh, so you'll want to talk with folks about going online, making sure they know the place. If they're gonna, if they are one of those folks that loves to vote on election day, and I'm typically one of those people, I just like to go in there and I like to thank the poll workers. I like to smile. I like to get yelled at for my Matriots T-shirt, and I get to change my clothes and come back. Um, <laughs> but but I'm not going on the day of. My precinct has changed where I live. I got a letter that said my precinct has changed. Uh, what other things, Jen, are we seeing anything else that's confusing? Yeah. So first off, let's, 
uh, <laughs> uh, first off, let's let's make sure we know exactly what IDs. So now you need um, strict photo ID for early voting as well as on election day. Um, and so that can be from the BMV, a state ID or a driver's license. It does not have to have the correct address, but it must be unexpired. Okay. You can use a passport card or booklet and, and military, our military friends, I'm, I'm concerned about them because, um, there's a change there too. Now, U S military ID, U S veteran ID, Ohio national guard card, county veteran ID no longer counts. And uh, so we're going to have a lot of folks um, falling through the cracks potentially that way. Keep in mind that um, if you don't have your proper ID on you, um, you will vote provisionally, but you only now have four days to get the proper ID to your board of elections for it to count. So that's really important. It used to be uh, a lot longer. Now it's only four days. Um, if you have people in your life that do not um, have IDs, um, you can go to votewriters.org, um, and they have a lot of incredible um, information there. Shout out to Joan Stack. She just keeps having great, great things to say. Um, thank you, Joan. But yeah, vote writers, they'll help individuals also get their backing documents which is particularly difficult. Um, you are right that a lot of polling locations have changed. That doesn't mean that that's like some sort of nasty thing that boards of elections are doing. It's just simply that um, the, the spaces they use may have already been um, uh, in use, right? Like they, they maybe they have vacation Bible school or, or they have some sort of back to school, big event thing, you know, who knows what it is, but there's a lot of places that are not available. So you want to check your polling location if you wait till election day. And then there also is a new calendar for absentee voting. Um, uh, let's see, the deadline for your absentee ballot is probably tomorrow. Is that right, Elizabeth? Um, because it's Correct. seven days yeah. in advance. So if you want to get your absentee ballot, you can use the last four of your social, but you should, um, you're going to print off that application and hand deliver that into the board of elections or just go directly to the board of elections and fill that out. Um, and then you, I would encourage you at this point to not put it in the mail, but then once you get your ballot, be ready to cast that no vote and take it back to the drop box if you can. If you do decide to mail it, Please don't wait this long, but you your deadline is to postmark it the day before the election, and then you only have four days of time for it to get there. So if for some reason the mail takes longer than that time frame, it's not going to count. Um, or you can take it to the Board of Elections by close of polls on election day. Do not take it to your polling location. Lots of voters take it to their polling location. Um, you mm -hmm. need to take your absentee ballot to the Board of Elections. I'm looking through the oh, chat. Go ahead. So today, so today is the, I can't do my election math. Today is the deadline for that. That is why they're open till 830 today, Elizabeth. That might be the other reason why they're doing that. So um, you, if you want to request your absentee ballot, you got to, um, It's a, we won't be mad at you if you jump off early, but you got to hightail it over to your board of elections. We will let you back in though, if you want to, you know, if you want to listen. Oh, it's not today. Today's July 31st. Tomorrow. I don't know. Yeah. Today yeah. is the 31st of July. We don't are still, share this video. <laughs> we are still firmly in July for the next six hours. Um, so by tomorrow, request your absentee ballot. And I see a Shelly Bromberg wrote a note. Another note for many of our elderly who live in public housing or nursing homes is the fact that they now need a near relative to submit their absentee ballot. This has been confusing for many. Um, and so Shelly, I don't know this requirement. Are you willing to make, oh, do you? Okay, Jen. It's it's not a new requirement. Not um, a new requirement. And so um, there's always been a requirement of having uh, like who can and cannot um, deliver an absentee ballot. Anyone can deliver the absentee ballot request, but requesting the absentee ballot itself, uh, I mean, turning in the absentee ballot itself, mm -hmm. um, it needs to be... Um, it can be, there's a whole list and Elizabeth probably has the list handy, um, but it can be your parents, your child, not grandchild, 
actually. Huh. Um, aunt, uncle, there's quite a few that you can, that a close family relative, um, but it cannot be your roommate cannot be a uh, common law marriage partner. It would have to be an actual married partner. Um, and so there's a whole list that of, of folks that can do that. That's always been the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is not necessarily um, easily prosecuted. The main reason for the limit is so that someone can't bring in like a hundred ballots or something right. like that. Um, I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to expand this. We've been trying to expand um, ballot returns um, to include grandchildren, caregivers, um, roommates, but we, we haven't gotten there. We will continue to work on that. One thing I will tell you is that we are concerned in general about people with disabilities being able to tackle all of these different barriers people with disabilities and our elderly are less likely to have IDs, less likely to have transportation to the early vote center, um, less likely to have someone who can um, deliver their ballot for them legally. And so if you're seeing, if you know of someone who's having that challenge, um, please let us know that right away um, because that's, we need to get data from folks like that so that we can continue to work on access for that issue. Can we talk about, um, this is from Lucy Getman, uh, on that topic, so similarly situated, do we, what do we know yep. about the curbside voting procedures? Yeah, so curbside is an incredibly important voting procedure, and it's one that's existed um, for a long time, it's just not advertised, um, and some polling locations will do this better than others, um, but curbside the way the language is, is it says that you must be physically unable to enter the early vote center or the polling location. Um, Physically unable, right? We could think of that as being someone who has like a challenge walking, um, but maybe we're we're concerned that people that maybe they're neurodivergent or there's some other challenge that they have um, that they will be afraid to ask for curbside. But what I want to say is that no one will be challenged on that. So if you uh, need curbside, uh, you ask for it. You, um, the one thing, there will be some counties that will do this better than others. Um, but if you need curbside, you might want to bring someone who can go into the polling location for you um, because what will happen is uh, most likely you'll find a parking spot. Usually it's the handicapped parking spots in near that polling location or that early vote center. There may not be a staff person out there. Um, And so someone will have to go in and let folks know that there is a voter who wants to vote curbside and they will bring the ballot out one Republican and one Democrat or one Republican, one independent, one Democrat independent, but people from two different parties will come out with the ballot um, and they can vote their curbside. So very confusing. Um, It's not, uh, the signage is not what it should be. It's not that easy in terms of you have to have someone with you most likely. Some boards of elections have a phone number that you can call, but most do not. And so um, it's good to bring someone with you. But again, if you ask to vote curbside or you know someone, who wants to vote curbside and that option has been close to them, that's when you let us know at the league and that's when you report it, it to 866 hour vote. Thank you. Also shout out Veronica McCreary Hall, another league superstar, um, Make getting the whole list there. Thank you. So thank you, Veronica, I see it there. And then Elizabeth was asking if there's time to answer quickly, because we do have two minutes left and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, Is there, when we're talking to women about the ways issue one is bad for Ohio, what are the arguments that resonate the most? Um, And so I'm happy to answer, or Jen, you can answer 
we can both answer because we both talk to a lot of women. Um, you know, for me, what has resonated most clearly with folks is this idea that it takes power away from the people and that women are women make up the, the most significant portion of our population in the state of Ohio and removing our voice from the citizen led initiative method is really bad for women for that particular matter. It, it, sometimes you can make some of the arguments about the reproductive rights ballot initiative, but I actually personally stay away from that as well. Again, because that's a single amendment and we're thinking holistically long-term. Women love to think long-term. We like to see what is the big picture? How does this help or hurt our families and our community? And it hurts us because we will no longer be able to have any check or balance on the government and the politicians who are currently in power. And women deserve that voice. They know that their voice is not being heard equally in, in our elected officials, right? We're only 27 to 29% of the elected officials in the state. There are zero women in statewide elected executive office. There are three on the state Supreme Court. There are 28.8% of the women in the Ohio, are women in, in the Ohio legislature. That is not representing, you know, the, the vast majority of women, right? We do not have gender parity in Ohio politics for women. And so when you start to remove the only place we actually do have gender parity from the conversation, like then we we lose, we lose all the power. We lose, we lose all the power that we should have and that we're having a hard enough time getting. So for me, that's typically the argument I make. Um, it's about our 51% across the state. But Jen, what do you see? Bottom line, I think we just, I think actually the communal messaging works. I think women in general care about their family, but everybody else's family, right? Mm -hmm. They care about their children. They care about everybody else's children. And so I think continuing to talk about how special interests paid off lawmakers to call for this election and that ultimately special interests know that they can get what they want out of lawmakers more mm -hmm. easily than they can get it from us. So they're trying to rig the game. They're, they are trying to take power away from us. They're actually trying to trick us into voting our own rights away. And I think that resonates across the board that that the best policies in Ohio have often been through ballot initiatives for and by the people through mm -hmm. ballot initiatives. And therefore, we need to preserve that freedom and not make it harder for citizen groups. Well, I can't think of a better way for us to end the evening than the arguments we would put forth to the women in our communities. Um, if you have additional questions, you can always email us at the Matriots. Um, I'll put my information in the, in the chat here. You can email the League of Women Voters. As you can tell, they are steeped in the knowledge of this work and deep in the process of it. She, Jen's like, oh, deep in the process of it. Um, well, yeah, I feel bad that we've messed up some of the election logistics. It's just, a scat it's called driving all over the state scattered brain. But um, we really will help you. If you need, if you have questions, just call our office. We, we would love to help you uh, in any way we can. And so please keep us posted on what you need. We're going with the with the initiative, the, the, the coalition's mine plus nine. So we would love for you to reach out to nine people you know, even if you think they maybe already voted. Um, get, get them on board. Think of who might not have gotten there and how you can talk with them about the issues they're having. We're here to support you and thankful for your time tonight. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, everyone.